hear you. Thanks. So as um, Sharon said, we are going to talk, Noah and I are going to talk about how we are starting self-advocacy from school age um, in our school. We both work at the Technology Center and at the Special Education School at Lake Izzy Shapiro and how we use technology to, to do that. At our school, um, we the, have um, students Lana, age 6 to 12. Um, I, um, can you come closer to the microphone so that, because, yes, uh, yeah. Is that better? Yes. Better? Okay. Can you speak so that we can hear you? At our school, we have students age 6 to 12. Dana, okay. Dana changed to um, presentation mode. Um, what do you mean by that? Slide, we can see, you know, um, the scoffiot bazaar and after him. I'm in presentation mode on my screen. What's all about? Maybe you can share it again. Now you yeah, want to share it. Yes, I will share it again. Is this better? Yeah. Yes, and maybe if you can, maybe um, like raise your voice a bit so that the okay. interpreters can hear you better. Okay. Sure. So at our school, we have students age six to twelve. They have complex motor and intellectual disabilities, and many of them use communication devices. We have multidisciplinary staff, so therapeutic staff and educational staff, and we work together in a transdisciplinary approach. We also consider the family as a partner um, in our approach, and we follow the model of the ICF and focus on participation. So why do we want to start talking or teaching self-advocacy at an early age? First of all, we need the children or we would like them to discover their own voice and discover who they are. And that will help avoid the development of learned helplessness. Learned helplessness happens when the adults or other people in the environment do things for the children, speak for the children, and they eventually learn that they don't need to try, they don't need to speak up because things will get done for them. And that will be very detriment detrimental for them later on. So we want to give them a voice as early as we can. How do we do that? One of the most important ways to do that is to make sure they have effective communication. And for children that are nonverbal, that means assistive communication. We make sure to have many opportunities during the day to make choices. We have opportunities for them to express their desires and their opinions. And one of the most important points and where we actually spend most of our um, resources or where we put the biggest impact when we're training our staff is that we need to support the students to do for themselves and not that we shouldn't do for them. And whether it's, you know, it's not in, done intentionally or with bad intention, but oftentimes staff do things for the children and we need to make sure they understand that the children need as much as they can to do for themselves. So at, at uh, our Beitis Shapiro School, we um, initially implemented self-advocacy in the adult programs. And later on, you're going to hear from um, some par participants in those programs. But it was realized early on that we needed to, um, or it was realized that we needed to start fostering the seeds of self-advocacy much earlier. And so we came to the school and we got training um, with Lilac, um, and um, we educated the professional staff and the support staff. It's very important that the educational assistants in the classrooms get the education as well in the training. And we started to integrate self-advocacy into the program as um, and into the curriculum as a core value. And I'm going to show you or 
talk about a few ways in which we did that. But first, it's important to acknowledge that once you give a voice, um, you introduce dilemmas. Um, school is not a democratic place. School has rules. School has um, a, a particular way that things need to get done. And even more so in a school for, for kids with special needs, there are therapies that have to happen. And how much space do you give for choice? So there's a balance between creating um, opportunities for self-advocacy and still maintaining um, some order in the school culture. Um, and um, there's, we had a lot of discussions about that, about what's appropriate or when it's, when it's appropriate for children to choose things and what they're able to choose and what their abilities are. Um, but what's important here and what the lesson really is, is that they can choose, that they can, that they have a voice and they can voice their opinion, but it's important for them to also know that just because they've chosen something or voiced their opinion doesn't always mean that that's what they're going to get or that's what's going to happen. That's an important lesson to learn too, but at least they know that they have a voice and then they can use it. So where we heavily um, rely on creating the self-advocacy is with communication. And this is very much where the technology lies is in assistive communication. And we need to assume that the speaker or the user of that device is intending what they say. So whatever they press on their device, they meant to say it. And oftentimes that's not clear, but we wanna assume that intent and we wanna acknowledge what they've said. And that way they learn that their voice matters. Many of our students are not yet literate. They're symbol communicators. That means that whatever is in their device is up to us. The limits of their language we are the limits of their language because we are the ones who put the symbols into the device. And that's very important to remember. And because of that, we need to make sure that we give them language of disagreement or we give them language of discontent so that when they're unhappy or when they have something to say, they have the variety of things to say it with, even though maybe that's something that we don't wanna hear, but they have to be able to say it and express themselves. The other thing about communication is that allowing communication beyond the obvious needs. Yes, of course, they need to be able to answer yes and no and say with their basic needs, when they're hungry, when they're thirsty, but they need beyond that. They need to be able to express all kinds of ideas and to be involved in conversation. But even the basic needs, it's beyond the, beyond the obvious in communication. We want to help them initiate. This is just a simple example. You're in a class, the students are eating and afterwards they need help to clean up. Many of our students can't use their hands themselves and they can't speak on their own without a device. So after a meal, the educational assistants will clean them up and wipe their face. But I wanted to make sure that this student, particular student in particular, that he could ask for it. He can't do it himself, but there's no reason why he can't ask and he can have the opportunity to say, my face is dirty, please clean my face, instead of somebody just assuming that it needs to be done and doing it for him. Another thing that we introduced was a student council. This may seem obvious at many schools, but at our school, it was something new. And the um, assistive communication really came in handy here, not just handy, but essential, and all our, because of the communication programs, all the students had an opportunity to create a platform. If they wanted to run for the student council, they used their uh, communication programs and created a beautiful platform that they could then present themselves to their classmates and their classmates could later then on their own devices, um, read it in an accessible manner and hear it again. Um, and of course, using the assistive communication is how they participated in the student council meetings and had their voices heard. Um, and the student council in and of itself is a wonderful um, opportunity for them to practice self-advocacy. We also started integrating students into their own IEP meetings. So every student according to their own abilities, some um, were able to share uh, with us what their desires were to learn for that year. Some just participated by listening and hearing what was going on. 
and others were able to hear later if it was something that they couldn't participate in for whatever reason. But it's important to understand that um, their presence is felt and, and they, they understand and are very much a part of the process of creating their goals for the year. Another way that we um, promote self-advocacy is by providing many opportunities for choosing and voting. Um, in day-to-day -day activities, um, many multiple times throughout the day, and that is something that has really been integrated by the staff, and it's just something that we do naturally. And one of the things that we've done is a lot of voting, which is important, I think, for the students to learn that, yes, they have a voice, but when you're in a group situation, everybody has a voice, and sometimes the majority rules, and you may not always get what you particularly want, but that you have the opportunity to voice your choice and your opinion. And in this particular example, we have a lesson um, where the children are, it's sort of like a research project kind of lesson. And it was the children that chose the topics. They had homework, they went home, they decided um, what they wanted to learn. They came back and presented everyone the idea. And then we had to vote. And whatever choice was they voted on was what the class then researched. Um, and they were each student chose their own subtopic. So there are a lot of opportunities here for giving them the sense that they get to choose and they determine what happens during their day. We also incorporated a weekly lesson, um, basically where they learned about problem solving, how to recognize a problem, how it feels when we come across a problem and how, and thinking of solutions together. Um, and What's really nice about that is they learn to come up with things on their own, solutions on their own, and that it's okay to ask for help when it's something that they really need. We also find opportunities to actually practice the advocacy. So um, for International Accessibility Day for people with disabilities, we took the opportunity to have a discussion with them about what is accessibility? Why do they need things to be accessible? What are their challenges? Um, we took them outside and they actually examined the front gate to the school to see if it was actually accessible. And it's a wonderful opportunity for them to develop identity of themselves and what their strengths are and what their challenges are. And then later they came back to the classroom and they used their technology, their AAC to create, um, to write a letter to the CEO and tell him that the gate isn't accessible and we need it to be more accessible for them. So it's a wonderful opportunity for self-advocacy. And we use exam um, opportunities like that to, to have this discussion, to open um, that discussion of thinking about themselves and developing that identity that was talked, many people have talked about already, but we want to have that conversation even early on. Um, right now, our school is preparing for World Walking Day and not all of our students walk independently. Some use walkers, some use motorized wheelchairs, some need to be pushed in a chair, but we had a conversation in advance and everybody got to talk about how it is that they are going to participate. And um, they learned, they listened to their friends and everybody got to try out different things. So wonderful opportunities to develop that identity. Another way is with enrichment activities. Our children get to choose an enrichment activity during the year, whether they want to learn photography or newspaper or gardening. And I, I, we feel that enrichment also leads to developing an identity and understanding things that they like to do and different ways of expressing themselves that they were able to carry with them and use later on in their life. And they learn through these self-expression, ways of self-expression, they learn that what they have to say matters. Okay, now just to tell you to start concluding, thank you. Yeah, just one more example that we um, often also consult our students when, it, when it's something that matters to them. Um, and we've brought in developers about different technologies that the children use and, and the, the developer ended up having a conversation with the students. So, um, he, they, they get to talk about things that matter to them in an important way and have an impact. So it's important that we start these processes at an early age. It comes with challenges and dilemmas, but with creative thinking and professional support, we can guide the children to develop those seeds of self-advocacy early on. And hopefully that will help impact their inclusion in society as they grow.
And technology obviously has a major role to play here, especially with respect to communication. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dana and uh, Noah. It's really interesting um, to, to see how um, AAC can help with um, self-advocacy and thank you for, for sharing these ideas with us. Um, now I introduce our last panelist, um, Lila Ahbar, um, who's the manager of the Leadership Center for People with Disability in Betisi Shapiro in Israel. And she will be explaining their work on leadership with AAC users and will present also um, the AAC Leadership Group. And after, she will be also talking about the Leadership Group of Health, who are working on how to make health services accessible. Lila, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I will present. You are you. muted, Lila. No, um, but we can't hear you. I can hear her. I can hear her. Okay. You. Okay. So I will present with my partner, Dr. Oli Hebel. Please join me, Oli. And we'll Thank continue you. what we just heard about self advocacy and leadership in the uh, presentations uh, before. So uh, I'm Lila. I'm a community social worker. I work at Beit Easy Shapiro, Israel. I'm in charge uh, of a leadership center of, of people with disabilities. We have seven different leadership groups and a total uh, about 80 activists, all people with disabilities. These activists are engaged in social change and activities for a policy change. So now you're going to hear about one of the groups the leadership group of people who use augmentative and alternative communication, AAC. And immediately after us, you will hear about another leadership group from our center, the Health Forum, a leadership group which deals with issues of health among people with disabilities. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Orly Hebel. I'm a speech and language pathologist and a member of the Israeli ISAAC chapter. ISAAC is a nonprofit organization that supports people who use AC systems and internationally promotes awareness to equal accessibility in all life circles for persons who cannot communicate. Actually, this, uh, we want to tell you that this group was a joint initiative of Isaac Israel and Beit Izzy Shapira. And Lilach and me collaborate in coordinating the group, uh, creating a conjunct dialogue of themes related to, the le to leadership and communicative competence of the participants. Um, I suggest, I think that's the best part, that we'll hear from the participants themselves uh, we, feel, we filmed in advance as they do not speak English and I would be uh, very happy if you could share the video of the group right now. <laughs> נולדתי וגדלתי בהרצליה, למדתי בטכניון מערכות מידע, יש לי גם תואר שני במנהל עסקים מאוניברסיטת תו א', לצערי, בפברואר 2008 הייתה לי תאונת דרכים בדרכי חזרה מהעבודה. מאז התאונה אינני יכולה לדבר בקולי, אבל אני מקלידה במחשב בעברית ובאנגלית והמחשב מדבר. אני בחורה עם סיפי, צד ימין שלי פגוע, אני יודעת ללכת לבד. יש לי כיסא ממונה, בגלל שקשה לי ללכת מרחקים ארוכים. אני משתמשת באייפד עם גרד לאייפד. אני חברת בקבוצת מנהיגות קטח. יום לי טומי ברצ'נקו, אני בן 24 וסטודנט לחינוך. אני פעיל זכויות אדם לאנשים עם מוגבלות ואני מתקשר דרך מחשב המופעל על ידי מערכת מיקוד מבט. שלום, אני ליד משתמש תתח. אני חכם מאוד. לא יכול לעשות את הדברים הפשוטים של האנשים הרגילים נראים ברורים וקלים ביום יום, כמו ללכת, לאכול, 
לשתות ולהתלבש לבד וגם קשה לי לקרוא, אבל אני חי את החיים, כמו אדם רגיל עם מטפל צמוד. אני פעיל בארגונים שונים, כולל בקבוצת המנהיגות הזאת ובהנהלת איזק. המנהיגות של אנשים המשתמשים בתת"ח היא קבוצה אחת מתוך מרכז מנהיגות שלם שיש אצלנו, אחת מתוך שבע קבוצות מנהיגות. אחד הדברים שמאפיינים את הקבוצה הזאת זה שאנשים שמשתמשים בתת"ח הם שייכים לאוכלוסייה שהיא מודרת, מוחלשת, מושתקת. גם בתוך עולם המוגבלויות עצמו, האוכלוסייה הזאת פחות מוכרת, פחות נשמעת. ומאוד מאוד חשוב לנו, דרך קבוצת המנהיגות הזאת, להנכיח את האוכלוסייה הזאת, לתת לאנשים שנמצאים פה תחושת מסוגלות, יכולת להשמיע את הקול שלהם ולהשפיע סביב נושאים שחשוב להם לקדם. בקבוצה למדתי להיות סבלני לאנשים אחרים וגם לעצמי. אני רוצה שיקחו גם אותנו בחשבון. אני רוצה לראות את השינויים נוספים בחברה, שיקבלו את השתמשי תת"ח, שלא יפחדו לדבר איתנו, ייתנו לנו קרדיט, שאנחנו מבינים דברים. קבוצת המנהיגות זו הפעם הראשונה שנפגשים יחד אנשים שאינם מדברים, יחד מבינים מה זה אומר להיות משתמש תת"ח, אנחנו בונים יחד את המעבר מהאישי לקבוצתי, לומדים לחכות בסבלנות לדבריו של חבר אחר בקבוצה. כיום כחלק מהעלאת מודעות שבה אנו עוסקים אנחנו רוצים לקדם סימל. שוט בדקנו מצאנו שיש בישראל סמלי נגישות עבור מגבלויות שונות אבל אף אחד מהם. לא מתייחס להנגשה תקשורתית. דעות קדומות של שופטים גורמות לכך, הם מתעלמים מעדויות של משתמשי תת"ח בבית המשפט. קבוצת המנהיגות לקחה על עצמה נגישות לצדק עבור אנשים המשתמשים בתת"ח. אנשים בחברה לא מכירים משתמשי תת"ח ולא יודעים איך להתמודד איתנו, הם חושבים, אם אנחנו לא מדברים אז אין לנו דעה, לפעמים חושבים. אם אנחנו לא מדברים אז גם אנחנו לא שומעים או לא מבינים, מדברים מעל הראש שלנו ואל המלווה שלנו, אנחנו רוצים להשתתף בחברה ולהיות חלק ממנה. השהייה במשך השנתיים וחצי האחרונות בקבוצה מרגשת מאוד, שהמשפט הזה של Nothing about us, about us קיבל משמעות אמיתית בתוך הקבוצה. התפתחו ברמה האישית, ביכולות שלהם לנהל שיח תקשורתי. שוב, לאחרים ולעצמם, ואני צופה שאנחנו נגיע רחוק. זאת קבוצת מנהיגות ייחודית, אין עוד כמוה בארץ ועוד מעטות מאוד בעולם. מדובר כאן על אנשים שמשתמשים בתת"ח, לקחו על עצמם להוביל תהליכים של שינוי חברתי. הם רוצים להשמיע את קולם, להיות נוכחים, להשתלב בהנהלות של עמותות, להשפיע על מדיניות. אותי זה מאוד מרגש. החוויה שלי שהכל אפשרי, קבוצות יכולות להתאגד ולהשמיע קול ולעשות שינוי חברתי, גם קבוצות שאף אחד לא חשב, יוכלו להתאגד, יכולות להתאגד ולהוביל שינוי משמעותי. Thank you. Well, the stars are all here, the stars you saw in the video, and I hope we'll have enough time. We'll, we'll try to leave a few minutes at the end so that you can ask some questions if you have. So we'll try only in me, just in a few sentences, to tell you a little, a little bit more about the process of working with this group. So the work, the group meets in... Uh, once uh, every three weeks. In these meetings, there's a uh, group discussions about what are the group's goals and objectives and how do they want to achieve them. As you can imagine, the discussion and all the processes, processes are re relatively slow because of the manner of communication. But for the most, it is a discussion just like any other group discussion. Yeah, it is, it is a, it, it does have its obstacles, but we are happy and proud that the group has been able to continue working, particularly continuously through the pandemic, 
And you can imagine that communicating with AAC um, users is challenging and it's even more complex on Zoom. Yet, you know, nothing about us without us, we learned from them that they can overcome the obstacles and retrospectively when the participants talked about it, uh, they say that the use of the AAC was actually an advantage, advantage sometimes and it wasn't as a disadvantage on the Zoom platform. Um, so for the group discussion to be more fluid in this particular group, there is a lot of preparation before the group meetings. Participants prepare some of their mess messages in advance to shorten the waiting time during the session. And the combination also of two facilitators allows us also to stimulate, uh, to simultaneously work on strengthening participants' communication skills and promote content that supports development of leadership skills. People who participate in our leadership groups, and this one particularly, um, experience, first of all, a personal empowerment process. They take control over their lives. They develop a develop a positive identity. They learn that the challenge and the experience are common to many people. Our job as professionals is to fac facilitate this process and provide the participants with a safe space in the group so that they can really um, gain the, the skills they need to truly become leaders. But not less important than the individual process that, that the participants go through is the group process. In the leadership group, people learn to work together as a team. They understand the power they have as a group. They learn to initiate collaboration with other partners, partners, and all that to act for policy change. Just to conclude, as you heard in the video, the group members have far-reaching plans, and we hope that the next time we meet, we can tell you about significant changes and successes that this group has led. And we, you know, in the name of all the participants, I want to thank you for your presence here. Thank you. Okay, so we'll pass now to the next presentation, Sharon. Yes, that's right. We can move to the next presentation, which is about um, health services and how digital can, can enhance accessibility. So, okay. So the presenter will be Osnaki Hestil Lahat and Inat Perry from the leadership group and the stage is yours, Osnat. Bear with me, this is a problem with my uh, Oh, hello. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for staying. Uh, until now, I am the last presenter, hence, I have a great uh, responsibility. I hope you won't fall asleep during the representation. Okay, so I am Osnat Haskelat, and I'm the facilitator of the Israeli Health Forum of people with disabilities uh, in Beit Easy Shapiro, also in the um, Leadership Center, which Lila told about, uh, talked about a few minutes ago. And uh, I am going to talk about promoting health and leadership of people with disabilities using technology. Uh, Dr. Inat Perry from the for forum helped me to uh, write this presentation. So thank you very much. She's in the audience. And she asked me to talk alone. So I'm going to talk alone. Okay. And please bear with me because my hands are paralyzed. The presentation might be a bit slower. Oh, okay. So, what about the health forum? When was it established? It was established about 14 years ago. Unbelievable. I'm getting older. In 2007, within the Alumot organization, which is an organization uh, which promotes promotes leadership of people with disabilities. How surprising, right? And we joined Beit Easy Shapiro at 2020, just a bit before the 
corona uh, pandemic. And uh, I'll tell you about the effects later. Uh, in the forum participate 18 people from all over Israel. Uh, they have all kinds of uh, disabilities. I myself use a motorized wheelchair, and as I told you, I have paralyzed hands. And they are from different cultures, different genders, and most of them are active in, also in other organizations, not only in the forum, hence very busy people. And we promote relevant accessibility regulations regarding health, uh, and, we have, and we are strategic partners of the Ministry of Health and the Commission for Equal Rights for People with Disability among the Ministry of Law in Israel, of course. And we are working through task teams dedicated to specific missions, which the technology enabled us to form. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later. So why did we create the, the forum? Either way, I must stress, this is the only forum of leaders with disability in Israel regarding health issues of health. Okay, so I suppose everyone here knows that know that people with disabilities are at higher risk for chronic diseases than the red general population due to many reasons. Some of them due to their disability. Yes. Some of them because of lack of suitable medical treatments or accessible treatments. And sometimes because uh, the medical, uh, like, um, I mean, doctors focus on their disabilities and not their well being in general. And we think we need to change that. So, what do we do? We promote regulation and legislation to ensure access to medical treatments and well being programs for people with disabilities. Okay, many programs for uh, concerning uh, well-being are not accessible. And also we raise the awareness of target, the target audience has people with disabilities and other stakeholders to these very important issues. So people with disabilities are leaders for the promotion of health of people with disabilities. So then we had Corona and uh, before the corona, we used to meet every six weeks, face to face, somewhere in Israel, uh, somewhere, of course, accessible, uh, both physically and, uh, and regarding transportation. Uh, but during the corona, of course, we couldn't meet face to face anymore. And we started to use, we started using the Zoom application. And my representation is going to talk about the pros and cons of Zoom. So apparently, like here, Zoom enable communication dis despite distance and physical challenge. Furthermore, uh, not only we could meet uh, through Zoom, we could only okay, we could also meet more frequently. If before the Corona we met only once uh, every six weeks, now we meet. We meet almost every day. I don't miss you guys. I meet you every day. Okay. Um, secondly, it enables us easy and cheap, adapt, cheaper adaptations like uh, transcription or translation, uh, screen readers, and such. Also, it enables us to record participation, hence, people with uh, cognitive uh, um, disabilities or other disabilities can uh, hear again our meeting, listen again to our meeting, and participate uh, participate as a uh, adapt oh, participate again. Okay. So, but still, technology has some cons. One of the problems with technology is not also always that adaptable to people with disabilities. Uh, we are Hebrew speakers. And transcription in Hebrew uh, is not that automatic transcription in Hebrew is not that uh, um, advanced yet. Hence, we need to use human aid 
by the way, hi, Dana. She's here also. And sometimes uh, adaptation may be expensive. And also as one of the, uh, the former um, representer, representers said, uh, if there are um, cultural um, gaps, then some people cannot or find it very difficult to use technology. So what are the conclusions of this part? If technology is more adapted and accessible, both financially and culturally, it may help connection, connecting people and lead to more interactions and of course, to leadership. So what, what did we use technology with to uh, a change? Okay, because we're talking about social change. Let's see. So um, at March, we conducted a Zoom conference talking about inaccessibility of the health system during the corona, okay? We had many important attendees like the Ministry of Health, Health Service Accessibility Coordinators in the HMOs, the Commission for Equal Rights of People with Disabilities, and of course, uh, the community of people with disabilities because nothing about us without us. We talked about accessibility of health services, services digital aids, home health care appliances and services, and web-based services, which, and the conclusions were, surprisingly, as that many of these services are not accessible, okay? And uh, secondly, the regulator must regulate the accessibility of digital aids as fast as possible and with the involvement of people with disabilities. And a third conclusion was that digital development will always be faster than regulation. But still, we can change that. We need to format a sufficient training mechanisms for all involved, for all involved in development of digital services involving people with disabilities in the earliest stages of development of services, because then it's cheaper and it takes less effort than adapting existing, existing devices which are not accessible, as we all know. Furthermore, we found out that we can actually attend parliament committees through Zoom. This is a picture of all of us. You can see the, our logo, right? You can say, I'll show you, this is me, hello. These are other members of our uh, um, leadership uh, group which participated in a debate in parliament regarding accessibility of the health services, followed by a vote. And not surprisingly, we actually affected the vote. These are very, very exciting. So what did we learn through the Zoom meetings? This is the last, almost the last uh, um, slide. Uh, although COVID-19 forced us to use tech instead of face-to-face uh, -face meetings, it also enabled us to study about people to participate together and uh, adapt the technology for people with uh, various disabilities. First of all, using human transcriptions, not only for people with hearing uh, um, impairments, but also for me, because I, uh, it's very difficult for me to write or uh, type, okay, people with other disabilities. Secondly, we chose to use WhatsApp, WhatsApp messages instead of Zoom chat, chat because people using screen readers found it a bit um, confusing to use them both at the same time. Raising hands, hello talking in turns and mute, which is very, very difficult for Israeli people who are used to talk all together at the same time. A precise placing of the camera to allow lip reading, as you can see now, for people with hearing impairments. Highlighting full screen and uh, font enlargement for people who have reading uh, impairments or other uh, learning disabilities. And what are the conclusions? I can think, I think I can sum up all this webinar in this uh, slide. Technology 
changes our society for better or worse. Technology can also enable us to participate and change society. In order for people with disability to benefit from technology, it needs to be adapted to different capability, capabilities, what a difficult word, and cultures of various communities to follow regulation, to, de to be developed carefully, and above all, and most importantly, to involve people with disabilities in all step steps of development, because nothing about us without us. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Osnat. Thank you, Lila, and uh, all the um, participants, Oli as well, Orly. Um, thank you for your work and very inspiring work. And uh, thank you for um, uh, us not for that conclusion. And actually, we saw that technology opens a lot of opportunities. It's enable um, uh, persons with disability to be heard. And most importantly, we have to, um, from earlier, start to um, involve them in uh, activities so that they will learn self-advocacy so that, yes, they can influence and they can be um, part of the decision making. Um, thank you all. I, I checking the question and answer, but I'm not seeing any questions here. Um, so, but thank you for your comments. Um, I'm seeing um, a very interest from the part um, from the um, audience, and uh, they were um, uh, enjoying the the presentation. Okay, so I think we can stop here. We don't have any questions. Thank you all again. And uh, thank you for attending and keeping with us. Sorry for being a bit over the time. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Bye, thank you.